I've made a lot of videos, but a recent one somehow engaged many viewers. This video was about why light slows down when it enters water, glass, or any transparent medium. For some reason, this video took off and the comments were very interesting, covering the entire gamut of claiming that the video was insightful to claiming that it was utter rubbish. But one particular question appeared over and over again, and that comment was, but why does light bend when it goes from air to glass? And it's true that I didn't answer that question because, well, it wasn't what the video was about. But a lot of people ask, so in this video, I thought I'd tell you why. Now as it happens, there are lots of wrong explanations out there. Lots. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell you the wrong ones and why they're wrong. Don't be surprised if I debunk one you learned. So let's start with what we see when a beam of light hits glass. Light traveling through air will change its direction when it hits the surface. The amount that its direction will change depends on the angle at which it hits the surface. Change the incident angle, and the transmitted angle will change correspondingly. Those angles are related through a physics formula called Snell's Law, named after Dutch astronomer Willebord Snellius, who lived in the 1600s. I have his formula written over here. If you'd like to learn how to use the formula, there are many online tutorials. But I'm not going to cover that here, because I want to get into the question of what is the physical process that causes the path of light to change as it enters the glass. So let's get into it. There are three commonly suggested explanations that are wrong, or at least incomplete. They are Fermat's principle, the analogy of soldiers marching, and Huygens principle. Fermat's principle says that light will travel from one point to the other, taking the minimum amount of time. It's often explained in terms of a lifeguard and a drowning swimmer. In order to maximize the chances that the swimmer will be saved, the lifeguard needs to get to them as soon as possible. So what path does the lifeguard take? He could run directly to the water and start swimming. This means he would swim a long distance, but because he can run so much faster than he can swim, that would be a bad choice. So you'd think that he might just run over to the point where the swimming portion is shortest, but that turns out not to be the shortest time either. Then there's the straight line path, and because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you might think that this is the fastest path. But because swimming is slower, it still isn't the shortest time. It turns out that the shortest total time, that is to say when you add both running and swimming time, is exactly what you'd get from Snell's Law for Light. You run a little longer than you would for the straightest path, but that means that you swim a little less and the total time is shortest. And that's exactly what light does. It follows the path of shortest time. But while that's true, it doesn't explain anything. It just says what it does, not why it does it. So that's not an explanation, and we need to come up with a proper reason. Let's look at the second option on the list. A very common explanation used to teach why light bends involves soldiers marching over firm ground, but then who encounter mud, although not all soldiers hit mud at the same time. The idea is simple. The first soldier who encounters the mud cannot move as quickly as the rest of the soldiers, so he slows down. Each soldier hits the mud in turn, resulting in a direction change. Eventually, the lines of soldiers are moving in a different direction at a different speed. This is how it's often taught. The problem is that this doesn't work. In fact, the soldiers will slow down, but their direction doesn't change. They will continue to walk in the same direction, but with marching lines that are slanted compared to how they started. This explanation gets the angle of the lines of soldiers right, but not the direction of travel. In fact, the only way that this explanation can be right is if the lines of soldiers are rigid. Then, the first soldier hitting the mud puts a torque on the entire line, and that would work. 
The problem is that this torque means that the soldiers on the top of the screen move faster, which is to say that if they were light, this part of the beam of light would have to move faster than light. So this explanation doesn't work either. Okay, so far we have a non-explanation and a wrong explanation. What about Huygens' principle? Huygens' principle, named after Dutch physicist Christian Huygens, depends crucially on the wave nature of light. We know that when a wave encounters a small gap, the wave passes through the gap and spreads out. This principle is called diffraction, and it's universal to all waves. If waves hit more than one gap, each gap will allow waves to pass through and make ringlets. The waves from each gap can interfere with one another, with the waves either adding to or subtracting from one another. In this animation, the lines show the position of the peak of the waves. Showing how the waves add together is perhaps easier looking at them from the side. When the peak of two waves encounter one another, the result is a single and bigger wave. And when a peak of one wave hits the trough of another wave, they can cancel each other out entirely. What Huygens claimed is that there is no need for gaps. Each and every spot on a wave was acting like it went through a gap and was spreading out. Now we can take that idea and have waves moving in one medium transition to another medium where the speed is different. So we can take light traveling through air and shoot it through glass. And, because we're interested in explaining the bending behavior, we'll have light hit it at an angle. Here's how the Huygens explanation goes. What happens is that the wave peaks hit the glass at different times. The waves then spread out and begin to interfere with one another. Notice that the wavelength is shorter in glass. That's because the wave is moving more slowly. Where the lines accumulate, that's where the waves add to one another. And they don't just line up in one spot. They line up again and again. Remember that the lines denote the top of the peaks of the waves. We can see that there are many places where the peaks line up. We can overlay a couple of lines that show the direction that the wave is traveling and then remove the circular waves and we see that this explanation seems to be doing a good job of predicting what happens when light goes from air to glass. Looks good, right? But not so fast. What happens when we look at all of the waves coming through the glass? Things get a lot more complicated. We do see that the waves add together to predict the direction that light moves in glass. On the other hand, that's not the only alignment. For instance, we see other geometries where the waves line up. There are the wave fronts that are going this way, and then there are the wave fronts going this way. So that's a problem. It seems that this approach doesn't give a unique prediction. Okay, we've ruled out Fermat's principle, the soldier analogy, and Huygens' principle. These are all often seen as explanations of the cause of refraction given by people who really do know some physics. So what's the real answer? It turns out that the only way to really answer the question of why light bends when it goes from air to glass is to get serious about the nature of light and to embrace the fact that it is made of oscillating electromagnetic fields, and that means you need Maxwell's equations. Because this isn't a full-blown physics class, I'm going to focus only on the electric fields. And I'm not going to do the derivation, because that's the fun part. I'll leave that to you. But the big ideas are actually pretty straightforward. You start with Maxwell's equations, which are always beautiful to see. They're a little scary looking, but the question we're trying to answer is an easy one, which makes the whole thing a lot simpler than you'd imagine. In fact, we're going to need only the bottom two equations. So let's see what's going on. We start with light going from air to glass, hitting the surface at an angle. In our figure, we can replace the waves with the direction of motion. Now it turns out that the electric field of light is perpendicular to the direction that light is traveling, and we can add that field direction to the diagram. And it's very important to remember that this field has a component both parallel to the surface of the glass and one that is perpendicular to the glass. 
And here is where Maxwell's equations come into play. Two copies of the equations are written here, one that covers when light is traveling in air and one where it is traveling in glass. So here's the key point. The surface belongs to both the air region and the glass region. This means that at the surface, the equations on the top and the equations on the bottom have to apply. And with that little bit of calculus, you can find two important restrictions. The first is that the electric field parallel to the surface of the glass has to be the same in the air and the glass. And similarly, perpendicular to the surface, what has to be the same is the electric field times this epsilon, which is different for each material and depends on its molecular makeup. We can then manipulate these equations to see what the electric field in glass should look like. Because epsilon is bigger in glass than in air, that means that the perpendicular electric field in glass has to be smaller than it is in air. Now we remember that the direction the light travels is perpendicular to the electric field, so we can put in an arrow to show the direction light must travel in the glass. And finally, we can see what light does when it enters glass or water or any transparent medium. It bends. And the reason that it bends is because the epsilon in glass is bigger than in air. Okay, what I just showed you is an equation thing. You're probably asking yourself what that epsilon actually physically means. It's there because of how the electric fields from the light interacts with the matter in the glass. You start out with glass with no electric field in it. The glass has charges in it, but they're arranged in a random way. But when you send light in, you impose an electric field on it. That field makes the charges move around, which sets up a counterbalancing electric field from the charges. The result is that the electric field in the glass is lower than it is in air because of how the electric field from the glass is in the opposite direction. And this is the reason that the perpendicular electric field is lower in glass. And that, my friends, is why light bends when it goes from air to glass. It's not because of many of the ordinary explanations. It's because of how light interacts with glass and changes the glass's properties. And it's because the electric field inside the glass is affected by the arrangements of atoms and molecules in the glass when light hits it. It's the same reason why light slows down in matter. Inside matter, the electric field due to the light and the electric field due to the matter both have to be taken into account. Outside, they don't. And now, you know some serious physics. Okay, so that was a very long video. It kind of had to be to cover the many incomplete or wrong explanations and then explain the correct cause. And I imagine that some of you will ask about the quantum explanation, which is similar to the one I told you here using Maxwell equations, except using energy and momentum of the photons instead. There's always more to learn in physics. Always more. And you knew that because, of course, physics is everything.